We're in the book of Romans, chapter 12. We're actually gonna look at one entire verse today, verse 13. Uh, I know it took us three weeks to get through verse 12. Uh, 13, we're gonna rock and roll through two concepts this morning. But I wanna introduce what we're gonna talk about today uh, in Paul's uh, uh, list of how to be transformed in the likeness of Christ uh, by uh, just talking a little bit about uh, commercial fishing. Uh, I don't know if you've watched the show Discovery Channel, The Deadliest Catch. You do know what I'm talking about? Yes, Deadliest Catch. Who would want this as a job? Massive waves, like I've been, I've, been, I've been deep sea fishing many times. It's nasty, but heavy waves, 40 foot swells, crashing over the deck. The, the crab pods are 700 pounds, they're swinging in the wind. It can knock you off into the water. If you get knocked off into the Bering, Bering Sea, you've only got a few minutes before they can fish you out or it's over for you. I mean, it's just a tough, tough job. Um, that particular job, which is like, I'm amazed that, that there's people on decks of those kinds of shi sh ships. So if you're, if you're eating crab, you should be thanking God for people like this. Um, I have a cousin, uh, uh, Bruce and Eric Baker, uh, and uh, my cousin Eric, uh, he, he does this. Uh, he's from Alaska. My uncle uh, Charles, before he, was, uh, uh, before he passed away, he was uh, one of the key weathermen for the state of uh, Alaska. So they lived in Nome, Alaska, uh, in the middle of nowhere. I had to drive hours to go see a tree. Um, so it wasn't any shock to the family when Eric became uh, a, a commercial fisherman. He got his own boat, Eskimo crew, the whole shebang. He has fished the, this whole area for years. Uh, and he's, he's, uh, he's familiar with the seas, uh, the demanding work, uh, working with those kind of individuals uh, and, and danger. Now, you have to understand, Eric, is, uh, he's a rough and tumble guy. So if you, we're about the same age. If you put me and Eric like side by side, he looks like he's been in, in the sea for many years. I mean, I, and it's the truth. I could talk about him. He's my cousin. So, um, you know, I've been inside a lot of my life, so my skin is, you know, not as weathered as his skin. Uh, his, is, his skin's weathered. I mean, he's got uh, just a rougher look about him. He's got uh, scars on his body from uh, the kind of work that he's had to do because it's very dangerous. He gets hurt, etc. Now, I paint this image to you of what that kind of person looks like to tell you this. When he was coming through my house in California, uh, our area, uh, in his off season, uh, he came by my mom's house in his, in his Mustang, and he told him, I'm like, hey, Eric, you know, like, what are you doing? And he's, you know, now that you're not fishing, he said, well, um, I'm heading to San Francisco to show some of my artwork. Huh? <laughs> What's the natural question if you're me? You do art? Are you kidding me? And I'm thinking, man, this is unbelievable. I mean, you just have to see him. Now, if he, he told me I'm, I'm going to, you know, do cage fighting or something, then that would fit. You know, he's that kind of guy, you know, because I know his, his life when he grew up. And so, um, so he, he, I said, well, show me your artwork. Like, what do you do? He said, let me go get my display box. So he went and got a box out of his car, set it at my mom's kitchen table, opened this huge box up, and in it was like red velvet, and there's these giant walrus tusks that he has taken from beaches in the Aleutian Islands where he, he stops and walks around, uh, and he takes them, and he takes a dental device, and he carves these three-dimensional uh, uh, fishing scenes in them. They were like photographs. I was like looking at them, looking at him, looking at them. Huh? It didn't even jive. Because my, I, I still can't even hardly think about it. It's like, they, these were like works of art. So I said, well, what do you do with, these are amazing. He goes, well, I, you know, in the off season, when I got a lot of time, I carve these, uh, you know, and they, yeah, then I take them to jewelry stores in San Francisco and, and I sell them. Like this, this is unbelievable. You take something that was on a beach, laying there dead, whitewashed in the, sun and in the surf and everything and you take this and you transform this into something beautiful this is amazing this is wonderful this is theological <laughs> steve it preaches doesn't it all day you can talk about a dead bone on its own you know. yeah because isn't that a perfect illustration of what you were before you knew christ like a whitewashed old dead bone nobody wanted right worthless and then what the master found you on the beach what do he do reached down pick you up called you by name so i'm going to transform you into something amazing he starts carving on you, and he starts carving on you, taking away things that you thought you needed, and he starts making things beautiful out of your life so that toward the end of your life, you should be able to look at your life and go, man, God, I'm not the same person that I used to be because he, he has carved on me. He has shaped me into his image. Now, when he's carving, is the carving, do you like it? What say you, Steve? No, you certainly don't like it. You can tell God, I had totally, hey, aren't you done in that area yet? No, I got more to go. 
And so this is when you think about my, my cousin Eric and what he's doing, that transformation process, just apply it to your spiritual walk because in Romans 12, Paul's talking about the transformation process. How does a, how does a Christian who's justified by faith, which was the first nine, uh, eight chapters of, of the book of Romans, if you'll remember, uh, how is a person uh, that's justified by faith transformed in the likeness of Christ? Well, he tells you how you do that. Now, all analogies break down because uh, in, in the analogy of, you know, the master craftsman carving on the bone, uh, the bone's not doing anything. But in, in the Christian walk, as the master, Jesus, works on your life, you're responsible to work too, right? And so that's what we find here in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21, are multiple commands of how to live a radically righteous life but it's on you to submit to the leadership of the master craftsman. Now, I won't go through the other nine concepts that we've already looked at, and it's taken us months to look at them because they're so important because you have to know these to live by them and apply them to then become Christ-like or mature. We wanna add uh, uh, items numbers 10 and 11 today to the repertoire of what should I do to be transformed into the likeness of Christ? What does God need to carve out in my life to help me look like him to my world? Two things, number one, Paul's gonna say in verse 13, be radically righteous concerning caring for Christians. Here's how he puts it. Contributing to the needs of who? The saints, the saints. That's not a sports team. The saints, who's that? Christians, Christians. Now NIV says, uh, share with the Lord's people who are in need. And then we'll get to the practice hospitality in just a minute. And then the Greek, I'm sure you can read it and see what it says. But we do have students at Dallas Seminary that are here, so they, they might need to see the Greek. So what we want to do is analyze this whole concept of, if I'm going to grow up in the faith, what does God need to chisel out of my life? Well, my, my, my lack of caring for people, because I'm so busy caring about myself. See, what the world needs to see is that you care about other people. But, but Paul limits it here to one field of people, just the saints. So does that mean that Paul isn't concerned about caring for all people? No. But he says, but when you think about it, you as a Christian should be first and foremost concerned about taking care of your brother and sister in Christ first. This is interesting. Let's stop and back up a little bit. Ask a simple question. Did Jesus care for all people no matter who they were, what their education was, the ethnicity? He didn't care, did he? No. So uh, you go through the book of John asking that question, who did Christ care for? Just go through the book of John and you can readily identify he cared for everybody. No exceptions. John 4, uh, he cares for a government official's son who is sick. He heals him. Uh, John uh, chapter 5, he heals a lame man at the Bull of Beth Bethesda. Uh, uh, John chapter 8, he heals, a, 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 in his story, the, the good Samaritan. Through that, he shows that the Jews should take care of a half-breed Samaritan. Should, they should because all men are important to God. So you can go through the, the list and you can understand, like in John chapter four, he takes care of the, the needs, the spiritual needs of the, of the Samaritan woman at the well. He actually walks in Samarian territory, which no Jew did, because they thought the, the, the soil was polluted. But he actually goes there and takes care of her spiritual needs. So he cared for anybody and everybody. And he tells us, in case you don't uh, pay attention to his life, pay attention to, to his commands. He says, if you want to boil the entire Old Testament down uh, to two concepts, and how many books are in the Old Testament, by the way? It's test time. We've got to show Steve how spiritual we are. 39, 39, 39 right? Because the word old has three letters and testament has nine. 39. And if you multiply those two together, you get 27. That's how many books are in the New Testament. So now you know. So... <laughs> It's a super spiritual point, I know. It's just a tidbit of information. Back to my sermon. So what did Jesus say? Summarize the Old Testament. Matthew 22. Jesus said unto them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. That's number one, numero uno. A number, verse 39, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these commandments depend, or I think the King James says, hang the whole law and the prophets. So he said, all of the Old Testament can be boiled down to these two things. Love God with everything that you've got and don't forget to love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Anybody and everybody. What's our nation forgetting? That very, those two very things. To love God with everything and then to love my neighbor who matter, they are, I care for them. What do we do? Well, it's a whole nother sermon, but we like to yell and scream at each other. It's unfortunate. 
But no Christian should be known for this. We should be known for those two things. So Jesus had a, a, a love for the world, but then Paul comes along and says, let me give you a command to grow up in Christ, to be transformed into Christ likeness. Uh, you need to care for uh, the saints, the saints. Uh, hagion is, is the word. And that particular word denotes what happens to you at the moment of salvation. So before you were a saint, what were you? You only have one option. It starts with the letter S. Sinners. Huh? Sinners. Sinners. We're playing Bible trivia here. So, yeah. Uh, so we're trying to move your pieces around. So before you were a saint, you were a sinner. So how did you become a saint? Except so Christ as Lord and Savior. I mean, that's, that's Romans 1 through 8. Once I come to him in faith, I accept his person and work on the cross for me and his resurrection. I confess him as Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9, I'm saved. I move from being a sinner to being a saint. So does anybody have to decree you after you're dead to be a saint? No. No one has to. Because at the moment of salvation, you are a saint, which means you should live saintly. You follow the logic? Live saintly. This is called a positional holiness. 1 Corinthians 1.30, Paul talks about it. That in Christ, he lists all that you have. One of them is holiness. He gives you his holiness. You didn't have any. Remember, you were a sinner. Once you become a saint, you get his positional holiness. Now, the problem is matching your position, holiness, with your daily practice. And, well, that has issues. You have any issues this week? Who lived a completely 100% holy life externally or internally this week? Did you? Liz did. Liz did. Okay, yeah. Just, <laughs> we'll talk. Yeah. As I said before, just jump in traffic, try to navigate. You'll, you'll see what I mean about trying to live a completely holy life when that happens to you. So Paul says in, in this passage, Romans 12, you want to take the dead bone of spiritual death and make it beautiful and wonderful alive and have God, God carve so, something wonderful into you. You need the, the holiness of Jesus. And then you need to match your daily walk with who you are in Jesus. So he says, how do you do this? Well, you take care of the saints. He, you show compassion to them. So I'll give you the word that he uses here in the passage for, for taking care of people. Uh, I'll give you the Greek word. You're probably going to know what it is because a lot of Bible studies are named after this. He says, I want you to show queno neo or what is it? See, you guys are fluent in Greek already. Queen, the language of the New Testament. He says, "Be show some koinonia to other people. What's that mean? Well, if you go and read all the lexical derivations of that word, you can summarize them up, and there's, there's uh, many of them in, in Danker's lexicon on, on the Greek text. Um, basically, they have one thing in common. It's to share sacrificially. Share sacrificially. See, that's what the New Testament is all about. Well, it's really in the Old Testament, quite clear in the New Testament. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Here's what Paul says. But let our people, too, learn to devote themselves to do good works, to supply urgent needs, so that they may not be unproductive. God wants you to be productive. What's a productive Christian look like? I see needs, not once. I see needs, and I step out, and I help meet that need of that other believer. An urgent need. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, so then while we have an opportunity, let us do good to all men. And then he throws in this little proviso, and especially to those who are the household of faith. Don't forget to take care of your brother and sister in Christ. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. Do not neglect doing good and sharing. Uh, for with such sacrifices, God is what? He's pleased when you share. Now, bear in mind that, that uh, verse from Hebrews, is, it has a negative in it. Do not. That negative wedded to this present tense verb means stop an action in progress. Meaning they were guilty of neglecting the needs of brothers and sisters in Christ. That is so bad. That is so unfortunate that they lost their car and they can't replace it. We will pray for you, even though I have plenty to give you. My wife and I have four cars, not, not us, but uh, my wife and I have four cars and the kids are gone and we only have, need two, but it, you know, it's too bad. Someone else will reach your need. No, he says if somebody has an urgent need, you step forward and you give to them. And he says, use, use this koinonia concept, sacrificial care. This was what made the New Testament church so exciting. They cared for each other. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 45, says about the New Testament church, when all those Jewish people recognized Christ and was Messiah, says in verse 45, they would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need, which means they didn't have any money. They had to sell stuff to get money to help people with their need. You ever done that? You sold property to help somebody else with their need. You had a garage sale to get money. To, you sold possessions. I mean, how many TVs does a man need? 
Three, thank you, yeah, three. <laughs> it's a Trinitarian concept. Yeah. <laughs> when are you going to Greece? Yeah. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. It's hard to stay on track when you have so much interaction. But uh, <laughs> they were selling stuff. When's the last time you said, well, I don't have enough money to help them, but we, can, we don't need three televisions. And you sell one of them. And where would you sell it anyway? How would you go about doing that? I don't like doing garage sales. Well, then what are your options? I got to be practical here. What are your options? Facebook, Facebook works really well. Ask my daughter. She sells. We buy her stuff. She uses it, and then she sells it. I always want the money back. She's like, no, Dad. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a personal thing. Um, what are your, your other options for selling stuff to help other people? Next door, Next door let go, Instagram, right. sign in your front yard, put it on the sidewalk. I mean, whatever. Sell your stuff to then help other people. That's what it's all about. And I don't have to give you all the scenarios, but you must pay attention to other people so that you can help them. So I can tell you what's going to happen when I dismiss you. What time is it? It's 10, 10, 19. So when I dismiss you about 10, 50, <laughs> not really, but, but when I dismiss you, I can tell you what happens because I watch what happens when I say amen, the final amen. <laughs> I mean, Steve, you will be amazed at how quickly they can leave this sanctuary. It is amazed. And here's my question. How are you going to know what people's needs are if you don't stand around and talk to them? Don't, and don't be walking around going, I have so many needs. <laughs> okay, okay, that's a whole nother thing, another sermon. Uh, you know, because I, I can give you illustrations. Um, but, but you should at least know each other, to talk, whether, whether you're in a life group, whatever it is, so that you hear what the needs are so that you can then say, well, I can help you do that. I might be a single guy, single woman, whatever. Um, I, we as a couple can help you. At, at least stick around. So it was really funny when I closed the last service how slowly they left. <laughs> it was super funny. They're all looking at each other like, can we actually leave now? Yeah, so I give you permission to leave. Just make sure you get to know each other, right? Which is gonna relate to our next point in just a minute. So Paul says, uh, live sacrificial by giving to other people. Uh, why should we wanna do this? Well, before we get to that, I wanna say how to go about it. So if you help somebody with a need, should you let other Christians know you did this? Well, they needed a vehicle, and you know, my wife and I, we had three, so we gave them one, you know. Hallelujah. <laughs> so if I do that, what have I just done? I just got my reward. Some angel just checked it off. Marty, there he goes again. Dink. He ain't getting that reward. How do I know that? Well, Jesus talked about this. So here's some advice from Jesus. Be Matthew 6, his first sermon, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness, righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who's in heaven. When you therefore give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. That's what the Pharisees did. I am about to donate a few denarii to this poor person. Please sound the trumpet. Da, 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 da. Are you kidding me? Wow, Rabbi Yehuda is so amazing. Every time he's gonna give, that trumpet goes off. No, did he, does he have a reward from God? No. No, Jesus says, don't do that. Here's what Jesus says. He says, truly I say to you, they have their full reward, but when you give your alms, don't let your right, left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your alms may be in secret, and your father who is in secret shall, shall repay you, like when you see him, when you see him. So if it were possible for your left hand to be giving to help somebody and your right hand not to know about it, do it at that level. That's how you should go about it. And why should I take care of Christians first and foremost? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, who we are. Verse 12, he says, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are, are many, they are one body, so also is Christ. We're a body. So what should the body do but take care of itself? Isn't that what your body parts do? They take care of yourself. He says, when you think about the body of Christ, take care of the body of Christ. What's the last thing you would want a non-Christian to see? Us not taking care of ourselves. Because chances are, if you're not taking care of the body of Christ, you're not probably taking care of people that are not part of the body of Christ. Uh, I can, and Steve can attest to this, as my wife can too. My dad, as I've told you before, had 10 sisters, uh, in, no brothers. And he was about three quarters of the way down the picking order. In the little southern town, nobody ever moved. I have a huge family, hundreds of relatives, literally. Uh, and so if you go to that little southern town, Kershaw, South Carolina, and you go to my, one of my aunt's houses, I can tell you what happens a lot at those homes when you're sitting there. People are coming over all the time visiting and you've just had, you know, fried pork, you know, chicken, pork chops, you've, you know, butter beans, the works, all the good stuff. 
cake of cornbread and there's leftovers and I'm young thinking, I can't wait, I got stuff to eat later. And then people come over from the family. I can tell you how the conversation goes when they hit the door. Have you had anything to eat? <laughs> we'll get you a plate. I mean, you're taking food out of my mouth. <laughs> and, I, and if they don't ask that question when they arrive, they ask it when they're leaving. So when they're going out the door, well, we'll see you later. And, and do you have any food? Do you want a plate? Then they're, they're meeting needs of the family. So what is a family member supposed to do but meet the needs of a family? And that's just how they function. So Paul says, when you think about the body of Christ, take care of needs. First John chapter three, verse 17, John says this, but whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, I have a question. What's the question? How does the love of God abide in him? And if you say you're a Christian and you know there's needs and you don't meet them, do you really love other Christians? I mean, is, do you really love God? See, it boils down to that. The more that you give, the more you're showing that you have the love of God. Why do we struggle with sharing? Now, I, would, I will submit to you, it's not my greatest thing about my person when I grew up. I did not like to share. I mean, I really didn't. Ask my wife. She knows. Steve, you don't know. Okay, you're not going to say. Okay, yeah. <laughs> You know, okay, so why do all of my Hot Wheels cars have no scratches on them from the 1960s? <laughs> why are no wheels bent? I mean, I look at the stuff online to sell my stuff, and I look at the stuff that's online, I'm thinking, junk. Mine looks brand new in the original box. Why? Because I didn't share them. When my friends are setting them on fire and blowing them up and everything, I was like, you're not touching my dragster. My friends didn't touch my cars because I didn't share them. I mean, I can tell you, my mom's not here, but she would attest to the fact that when my cousin Stephen came to go visit us one time, uh, he was about three years younger than me, and I actually asked my mom this question. I wasn't a Christian at the time when I said this, but I, but I actually asked her, how long is he staying? Because I didn't want him touching my stuff. You know, and so you, you have to look at, you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm so glad I am not like him. You probably got other issues, but if you're a Christian, <laughs> If you're a Christian, you should be sharing. Sharing, it's koinonia, caring for other people, releasing things uh, to be used. Do not ask me if you can look at my Hot Wheels cars and have them for a week or so. I, I still have them. I'm just saying, I still, now they're a collector's item. I'll use them when I retire. But, but give to those who are around you. Look for ways to give. My wife and I do. We look for ways to give and to reach out to people. That's how you transform in the likeness of Christ. You let go of things to meet needs. Secondly, be radical when it comes to hospitality. Hospitality, this is an interesting one. He says, contribute to the needs of the saints and practicing, be known as one who is practicing hospitality. Not who practiced hospitality, but it's a present tense imperative, meaning it's your lifestyle is one of hospitality. It's very interesting. Hospitality, the Greek word, is two words stapled together. They do this in German. They do this in Greek. They take this one word uh, for friend, phylos, and they wed it to the word xenos, which means stranger. Brotherly love of a stranger is the word for hospitality. Interesting, interesting. Paul says, when you think about your growth in Christ, be one known for loving strangers. That's really what it translates literally as. And when he uses this word uh, practicing, the word to practice, uh, dioko is the word in Greek. This is a very interesting word. And when I looked that up, I just started smiling when I read the word. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. The word for practicing in Greek, dioko, means to move rapidly and, and decisively towards somebody. <laughs> Why is that funny? Well, think about it. When, you, when you're gonna be hospitable to somebody that you don't even know, do you move quickly toward them? I, I, I don't know, honey, they kind of look sketchy. They're not from around here. Look at, look at her clothes, I mean, nothing matches. And their hair, I mean, look at those, look at them. We couldn't have them in our house, et cetera. You start moving slowly, right? You think of all the reasons why you're moving slowly. What does Paul say? He uses the word dioko, which means to move speedily towards showing hospitality. This is amazing. What does it mean to be hospitable? What does it mean? There's a variety of things. I'll give you some ideas in case you have no idea. Number one, it means you don't have any people over for food and fellowship in your house. You don't mind. You don't mind. Um, it means that you are friendly and welcoming just as a person. I mean, even in church, you're just a welcoming person. Uh, it means that you uh, do want to make guests feel at home when they're in your house or in our worship house. It means you would actually open your house to a life group. 
And by the way, I mean, we have like seven or 800 people in life groups. They meet in homes. So all of those people are saying, we're hospitable. Uh, it means that uh, when you look at the guy in your yard and it's, it's the dead of summer and it's like 95 degrees and it's like 96% of humidity and you're looking out the window as you're drinking a glass of iced tea and you're thinking to yourself, praise God, I'm not out there. What should you be doing? Taking him what? Something to drink. Taking something to drink. You know, pretty soon here, they're gonna be plowing the streets, right, for snow. My mother actually said this the other day. I just can't wait to move to Virginia and leave California after living there all my life because I want to sit in my apartment and just watch the snow fall. Where are you from? <laughs> but pretty soon you'll be out, you know, shoveling your driveway. You know the drill. You shovel the driveway, you're wiped out, and then the guy comes by with the <laughs> snow truck, the plow, and buries your driveway. And it's not normal snow. It's like chunks of ice and you got to go out with this ice you know shovel and break it up and everything and you you just you want to talk to that guy <laughs> I've actually stopped them before in a Christian way <laughs> <laughs> and taking them something warm to drink because imagine their job and I stopped the guy's big old thing one time out in the middle of the street so I got, can I talk to you he was all freaking out you know and I'm like hey, can I talk to you and he opened the door and, and, uh, and I lose reward by telling you this but <laughs> I'm just saying if anything I'm real uh, I gave him something warm to drink but isn't that what you should be doing stop that guy see that's being hospitable uh, it means that you don't mind missionaries staying with you it means that you don't mind somebody staying with you because their escrow hasn't closed yet and they need a place it doesn't mind you don't mind you have them over it means that when they come you give them the best that you have you don't like let multiple people sleep on the sheets a couple of times. <laughs> I'm just saying that when they come in, on the bed is a piece of paper that says Wi-Fi access. Because you, you, you know how you got to minister to them. They got to have Wi-Fi. I mean, you just set things up to love them. You find out, do you have food allergies? I don't want to serve things. I mean, you think about them, not yourself, etc. It means you give them the best that you have. Did you hear me? You give them the best that you have. Um, <laughs> when Steve and I were young men, uh, he sang in male chorale at Azusa Pacific University before I did, and then I eventually joined when I came to school. 50 men sang all over LA, and then we went on tours and sang all over everywhere. Uh, that was a lot of fun, that was a lot of fun. But, but I stayed in a lot of homes. And I stayed in a lot of homes, I don't know if I'm going back there. <laughs> wow, they were a mess. Uh, and they did some weird things. So what would happen when you would stay in these homes as you'd go to concerts, and then back the next morning on the bus, you'd compare notes, like who'd you stay with? Like what happened there? Because we had all kinds of interesting stories as young you know, men. Well, they hooked us up with a lady, uh, uh, me and my buddy. Uh, they hooked us up one night, and I think we were up in Washington State with this lady uh, and, and, and her husband, and that was who we were gonna stay with. So we went home with them. And, and so while we're sitting there talking with them on, on the couch, this is what the lady said. She said, remember my premises, make sure you serve them your best. You might want to taste your best before you serve it. Just keep that in mind. So the lady told us, she goes, you know, the next morning you boys are going to love breakfast. We're going to have waffles and fresh sausage. Because my husband and I, we killed a pig, and we have made some wonderful sausage. You're going to just love it. I'm like, whoa, awesome. Next morning at breakfast, I saw the waffles. I sat down with my, my roommate, Lowell, and we sat down. And he's, he's already there. He's kind of looking at me like, Dude, don't say anything. And I'm like, what? And so on the, on the table is a giant plate with a pyramidal stack of sausage. I mean, like enough for the entire choir, 50 men. And, uh, and, and, and so I grabbed a couple pieces and I stuck it on my plate and I began to cut into the waffle and then I, you know, you know like you do, you know, you ate the waffle and going for the sausage. So I cut into the sausage and put it in my mouth. I realized at that point, it wasn't, I couldn't swallow it. I don't know if swallowable is a word, but it wasn't going down because of the rancid nature of that particular piece of sausage. It was the worst thing I'd ever put in my mouth. And, and I'm 18, I can eat anything. And I'm looking at Lowell going, I got an issue, man. He's looking at me like, I was trying to tell you with my eyes, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, what am I gonna do? There's a whole pyramid of this stuff. And so when she was, I, I'll confess, I don't even know, Steve, if I told you this, but. But while I'm there, I, I had to do something. So I, I, I had my napkin in my lap, and so I took the sausage out of my mouth and I stuck it in the napkin. And then I did that for all the sausage I ate. 
So, so pretty soon there's a giant wad of sausage in my napkin. So the lady walks over to the table. Remember I told you, if you're going to give him your best, you might want to taste it or have other people taste it. And so, uh, so the lady came over to the table when the sausage pile was disappearing. And she said this at the, to me and my roommate. She said, oh, you boys are really tearing into that sausage. I'll go make more. I saw my life flash before my eyes. So when we were done with breakfast, and when she wasn't looking, she's in the kitchen, uh, I took my giant basketball size of napkin down the hallway into the bathroom, set it on the counter, and started shaving, thinking, whoa, I can't believe that. Then my roommate came in, and he's like, can you believe that sausage? It was like, that was terrible. I'm like, "Eh, totally. So we left, got our suitcases, got in the bus. We're talking to all our buddies on the bus. How'd your night go? Who'd you stay with? What happened? Blah, blah, blah. We're like, you cannot believe what we had to eat. um, Because our choir director told us, Dr. Bonner, whatever they give you, eat it. Whatever they give you, drink it. Say nothing. But you can tell your buddies the next morning. So we did. This was, oh, it was terrible. Somebody from the back of the bus, as I was talking, said, hey, Marty man, what'd you do with the sausage? (laughs) Yeah, what'd I do with the sausage? What do you think I did with the sausage? I left it on the vanity. (laughs) Yeah. I'll probably have to, she's probably first in line when I get to heaven. (laughs) Hey, aren't you the guy? (laughs) I confess. But my point is this, give them your best and it might be good to have other people taste it, okay? Why are we we slow to show hospitality? I'll give you the reasons. Uh, We don't know them. Well, it's, the word means to love strangers, so that doesn't fly. Uh, They look sketchy, like I said. They, They look like introverts. What will we talk about? I'm an introvert. What would I talk about? Uh, I'm a hoarder. There's no place for them to sit. (laughs) I'm a clean freak. I can't have them touching anything, messing anything up. Uh, I've heard this one a lot. We can't have you over because you like lawn work and our lawn's not squared away. You you can't see our lawn. We got one look. I mean, if the guy's a landscaper, still invite him over, et cetera. Uh, My wife doesn't cook. I don't cook. Then order out. Uh, when Liz and I were young people at seminary, I think it was our second year at seminary, uh, Dallas Seminary, uh, we were living in these Swiss Air apartments and we were broke. I mean, I think that one year we made like $8,000, tuition was 4000 and we lived on the difference. It was rough. And so we finally saved up enough money to buy our first couch and love seat. And it was off a store, they were selling this stuff at a gas station on a corner. And we bought it. It was terrible furniture, but we were so excited. 275 cash, I couldn't believe we had that kind of money. So we bought this and we took it home and and, and Steve and Marla uh, at the time called us and said, hey, we got friends that are in your area and and we'd like them to come over and meet you guys. I'm like, I don't know your friends, but what's a biblical mandate? Show hospitality. And so we had, Steve, I don't even know if you remember this. We had them over and they came over, they brought their two kids and they had a little boy. I think his name was Johnny. And he came over, cowboy shirt and pants and everything, and cowboy boots. And he sat down and he ate, and he was really obnoxious during dinner, this little kid. After dinner, he looked at his mom and dad and said, I finished my dinner, can I be dismissed? And they said, sure. I'm thinking, where's he going? I mean, it's a small apartment. (laughs) He leaves and he goes behind his dad, where our love seat was, and he sits down. So I began to talk to his parents. All of a sudden, I start hearing this, yippee, multiple times. I look past his dad and I see his son using our new love seat as a trampoline with his cowboy boots. If this is your child, what would you do? This is what the dad did. Son, son, quit jumping on that chair. I'm thinking, praise God, praise God. Somebody stopped them. And then he said this, if you're gonna jump on the new furniture, at least take off your cowboy boots. (laughs) See, when you show hospitality, you gotta put up lots of things, don't you? Right, but do you stop doing that? No, you just don't invite those people back, but you... (laughs) What's the ultimate motivation, you know, for showing hospitality? For me, I'll give it to you. It's Hebrews 13, 1, where the author says, let love of brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Why? For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Next couple that comes in here and you're thinking they're strangers. You have them over for lunch. Your first question should be, are you angels? Yeah. (laughs) You, You from around here? Yeah. The last thing you would want, this is my last closing word of advice, is to get to heaven and some angel walks up to you and goes, what's up, man? 
We ran into you and you didn't have us over. And you know what I'm saying? Or you had us over and you served us that sausage. <laughs> anyway, let's pray. Hey God, we can laugh about these things, but, but then they're all serious too. Cause we know deep in our heart that these are two areas that are tough, tough to, to get our hands around. Might we live sacrificially, give up things to bless other people in their lives that have needs. And might we truly be so hospitable uh, as you were that the, the lost and the saved around us can see what it means to truly love people. Might we continue to be those people and grow in our ability in both of those areas to your glory, amen.